Okay, so we need we need to let it rip here a minute. I I read I read all your bios, which are extraordinary, but we need to I need the real story. So let's just go down the road. How did you go from where you come from to being this mortgage ginormous maven, which we have to let every Latina know that you have mortgages because I need them too. Thank you, Nara of Sacramento. Uh, so I, I never gave myself a, an option. I went um, from cleaning real estate offices from the time I was 12 years old uh, as a maid with my mother at night um, into wondering you know, how I could make pretty good money at 12 years old. So at 16, I started my first entry in the mortgage business. So um, I'm celebrating my 34th year in June. I'm currently the largest Latina-owned mortgage bank in the United States of America. So I never, I never, I just never quit trying. And, and, and just like Nellie said, um, with a lot of obstacles, anybody in here in finance knows we have many as we ride the wave of mortgage lending. So silver lining is, is I'm still here, even after the aftermath of 2007. So that's the beginning. The beginning and kind of a short end. I live by three Ds, drive, determination, and dedication. And I believe if you have something like that that you can live by, you can accomplish anything you want in your life. And so for me, I grew up in San Francisco. I was born in Hearst Point, lived in the Mission. Um, you know, graduated Mission High School, and I've just been very focused my whole life. I was not going to stay in the Mission. I was not going to get pregnant early. I was not going to be a drug addict. I was going to make something of myself. And for me, it's really important to be self-sufficient, first and foremost, to be able to depend on myself. Man, I love you, but you're an additive. You bring extra value to me. She's <laughs> And, and I think if you set your sights on making yourself a good person, then you can help others. Um, you know, there's a reason on the airlines they tell you put your mask on first. Because you can't help anybody else until you help yourself. And so as a mom, I have five kids, believe me, as a mom, it's really hard to do that because you always want to take care of everybody else first. But once my last one was um, 18, I was like, it's all about me now, you guys. It's all about me. And I probably should have did that a lot earlier, but it is all about me. And my kids will go, what are you doing, Mom? I'm doing this. Well, God, what about us? I say, hey, you're welcome to come. You're welcome to do whatever you want. But you know what? Now my life is all about me. And I think that's what you need to focus on. Well, as you guys saw in my video, I mean, financial struggles were always uh, very present. And it, for me, it's just believing in yourself and just focus, just focus on what you want and just follow that intuition, follow that gut feeling like, I can do this, I believe in myself. Be your own cheerleader and just focus and, and never give up, never give up. There's, there's one of my pet peeves, people that quit and just never, never quit. And one of my favorite say, sayings is, every time you quit, there's someone there ready to take your place. And I live by that, I'm like, I'm quitting. success, I'm going to tell us a little different than what you do, Nellie, but I used to attribute success to having a raise, making more money, always, because growing up in a poor way, you see people that are rich and you go, wow, so arriving must mean that you have money. So every time I would get a promotion, every time I, my salary would increase, I thought I was being more successful. And then I found myself in a job where I was making like 200 plus thousand a year and I hated my job. I was like the flower in the basement with no windows. And I quit that job, I started my own business, and I decided that I was gonna live my life to drive my passion. And ever since then, I start living my life for my passion. The money still comes, but it comes in a different way. 
And so I started, I mean, I remember as a kid, it's like I wanted to buy money, I wanted to buy Barbie dolls, I wanted to buy clothes for my Barbie dolls. How many of you girls play Barbie dolls? <laughs> you know, I wasn't gonna, nobody was giving them to me, so I had to buy them, so I'd go babysit. I'd go babysit and, you know, save my money. I used to give loans to my brothers and sisters. I'm the baby in the family, but I was the bank. And I'd give them loans, and I'd charge them interest on those loans, because I was always the saver. I was always the one that had the money. And so, I, and I do believe in giving back. I give back, but I also make sure I take care of myself first, because I can't contribute to everybody else if I'm not contributing to me. So having a retirement plan in place, having a home, those are things that are really important because that's building your future. And investing, you guys, you gotta invest in stocks. You know, real estate, yeah. I still like my shoes, but you gotta invest in real estate, but also you guys invest in stocks. I mean, you, you gotta watch the market. And today, it's so easy for you to do it because there's so many tools out there for you to do it that it's really easy, you know, buy low, sell high. That's the, that's the idea. My story's not so glamorous. I just switched. No, I think, and I've been watching you, incredible speaker, and you know, I'm gonna tell you I'm not that person in myself. I'm learning to be that person. I'm learning to be confident. I'm learning to be accepting for who I am. What I what does resonate when I listen to other people's stories is that how we are who we are very soon in life. I remember very little in Tijuana, running around Tijuana. Um, and my nana told me, you know, um, I need to borrow money. I'm like, oh no, see, you're cheap. I'm like, I am? No, I'm foundational. I've learned that. I need, I liked the, to build a foundation at a very young age, I, and, and it had to attribute to, to money because we did grow up poor too, so I figured I need to, to then hold on to my money. So those kind of fundamental things, when you start to think back about your life story, and, and now that I'm able to tell you my story, is that from a very young age, I think foundationally that's who I was. I was an entrepreneur at a very young age. I was the leader of the family. I'm the, my mother's one of five girls. I only have three kids. All of you win. I only have three, I stop. But, you know, my grandmother's single mother, five girls. I was the first grandchild, so I was the leader of the family because the, the rest of the family was working so much. But now as I've grown into my career um, and I start to think back fundamentally who I, who I was, you know, I didn't go to college. I am the product of an immigrant mother. I am her dream. I'm living it. I'm walking it. Every time I'm on the news or something, I run home to my mom because I feel like I am her victory, the reason why she came here, the reason why she lived in a closet the reason why she bagged potatoes, right? We all have that story. So for me, I'm still learning to be that person. I'm still learning to be accepting of who I am and where I'm sitting today. And it isn't about money for me. I, I had too, had already finished building my foundation at 45. Mm -hmm. So I tell everybody that's done. So it's not good for you guys to hear. Latina foundation done myself. And now taking care of my family, and it's really fun. But now I tell everybody I have my cake, now I'm eating the frosting, because it's a lot more fun when the foundation is built. But, it's, but I'm telling you that story because if you think about who you are, it started at a very young age. I'm very foundational. I need that secure foundation. Being in mortgage lending, it's, it, it's, it, that is my biggest fear, is because that foundation would be taken away very quickly. Um, so people often ask me in, in such a highly regulated business, how is it that you feel comfortable? Because I need to trust in myself that I built a company since 1997 that was able to sustain during the worst financial meltdown in America and then grow to be, I'm in the top 14 in America at, with my head down and never as a goal. People say, oh, is that your goal? No. Was it a dream? Of course. I always looked up. I always looked up at Countrywide and Angelo and thought, men, men, men. But now I'm sitting here when I met Nellie, same, same, two years ago at NARA, saw Nellie. And I am successful, but I'm still being inspired by people like Nellie, because I'm still trying to find myself and my voice and who I am. So it, certainly if it were about money, I should be secure, right? And I should be very confident in who I am. 
but it's not about money. It's are you living your best life? Are you, and I, and I am now giving back, and that's why I'm telling you to try to be real so that everybody understands, even when you've made the foundation and our buildings are bought and we're making money off our buildings, we're still so excited to be learning and making ourselves better. And same as Nellie is in my practice in mortgage lending, I'm really trying to get women to step up into leadership roles. I don't want to be the only large woman on mortgage bank. I don't want, I, we need more top producing realtors, women realtors, uh, loan officers, and I'm not seeing that. So for me, that's, mm -hmm. you know, foundationally where I'm coming from. So I'm still learning to kind of be secure in that. But I think I'm going to throw her a question right now. I think there, there is something to be said about, it's easy for us to say that the money doesn't make us happy, but on the other hand, I think we have to say that there's one thing about being in survival versus getting out of survival where you're living paycheck to paycheck to pay the bills. When you get on the other side of that, let's just let's not call it happiness, but there is a freedom that comes from being able to have bigger ideas because you're not worried about crashing from one day to the next, right? So I think there's something to be said for that. And so, Angie, I'm going to ask you the same question, but in a different way, because we know that you've had, you know, you've had issues with coming from nothing and all that. But when did you do the click in your head about ownership? Because I think ownership is a mindset. When you decide, you know, and I had this conversation with Cheryl Sandberg, because she wrote Lean In, and she's like, we need to lean into corporations. And I go, well, that's great, but not everybody goes to Harvard and has a linear career and has three mentors and has stock in a company. So for me, I think the, the, the common denominator is your ability to have ownership in some part of your life. And I think that click happened for you, so I'm going to pass it to you. Oh, I have my, I have a thing right here. Does it work? Does it work? Okay, good. So yes, I mean, I've, you know, like Patty, I mean, I was a daughter of immigrants and I remember I would, uh, I was 12 years old and I would sit and cry and look at the classifieds and think, how come nobody hires me? I'm crying, I want to get a job, I'm struggling. And I first got my first job busting tables when I was 13. So for me, it was just work, 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 work. And I found myself, I believed in home ownership. I wanted to be, you know, a real church, you know how to get started. And I found that I was good at sales, so I'm like, well, what can I sell that is, will make me money? What do I need to do to, you know, get myself money? And, you know, start a career in real estate. But it wasn't, I was just coming along, coming along, coming along. But it wasn't until, you know, obviously I went to the, to the, I went to the, I went to the, I went to the NARA conference, and then it was there, and it was like, that was like an aha moment for like me, like, aha, uh -huh, like, this is what I need to do. Like, I need to focus on myself. It's okay for me to be selfish. It's okay for me to stop giving. It's okay for me to just be me and love myself and invest in myself. There's nothing wrong with that. So I think that was, thank you, Nelly, that was a very inspirational aha moment for me. And you talked about ownership too, so I want to hear well, and it's kind of funny because you talked about a lot of these women in nonprofits. I actually run nonprofits now. That's what I do. I mean, one of my strengths is restructuring organizations and turning around and getting them back to profit. And that's what I do. I go and I find organizations that are failing. Crazy. I don't know why I do it because, believe me, mentally it's painful, especially when you're dealing with boards. You're trying to get the right, you know, formula of board members, trying to get the right formula of staff and all that. But um, for me, it's just about, you know, being able to focus on that. And just from early on, I would just set my sights on stuff, and I would set my goals, and I would say, you know what? It's not all about material things, but material things do make you happy, ladies and men. you got to admit that, right? But I really try to tell my kids to make sure they have a balance with that, because you just don't want to be driving your whole life towards material things and wake up one day and you have nobody around you to share it with. So it's really important to have that balance of people that you bring along with you as well. And so for me, it's just about setting my sights and saying, you know what, I want to make sure I have a retirement plan because I can't live uncomfortably and, and not be able to take care of myself. I, there's a certain lifestyle I want to have, and I want to make sure I can afford it. You know, health insurance is important to me. I can never live without that. i got to make sure. It can be way before Obamacare. You know, I have to be able to have health insurance. So there's certain things in life that I always said, these are things that are non-negotiable for me that I have to make sure I have. 
when each of my kids was a sophomore in high school, I did this exercise with them. I, my background was banking 23 years, so financial, you know, finances is really important. And each of my kids, I said, what kind of lifestyle do you want to have? Mm. And I said, what do you need to do to afford that lifestyle? How much money do you need to make? So I made them do a plan and say, okay, what kind of car do you want to drive? Okay, so how much is that car going to cost? You got to have insurance. Okay, where do you want to live? You have an apartment. Where do you want that apartment to be? How much is it going to be? Oh, you got to have utilities. You got to have this. You got to have that. So they had to sit there and write out a plan. And then I said, oh, well, so times that by 12. So how much do you need to make a year to afford that lifestyle? Because the lifestyle I have, I created. You don't get it. So once you turn 18 years old, you got to create that for yourself. It's the reality, right? Because our kids, they never want to leave. <laughs> This, you know, it's a good thing. They want to stay. And, I, and the other thing I do with my kids is as long as they were going to school, they could live home free. They didn't have to pay to live at home. But if they weren't going to school, they had to pay rent. I only charge them 100 bucks a month, but still, they had to pay something and they had to follow my rules, which means you can't come in the house after 10 o'clock at night, except on, um, you know, Friday and Saturday. But any other day, you have to be in by 10 because you're not going to wake me up. Well, that's not really, you know, inviting if you're a young kid and you want to go out and party, right? No, no, they did. Some of them did because they thought they could do better on their own. And I said, okay, that's all right. Just come home. I cook, so they come back, right? That's how you do it. But to me, it's like just sitting in your sights, you guys. And I think the best thing you could do for your children, don't give them everything. Make them work for things. Make them understand. Because I think our biggest downfall, you guys know this too. As I talk to people about like generation, all of us have had such a hard life. We struggled so much to get what we have today. We want to make it easier for our kids, but you know what our downfall is? They don't know what it is to want. They don't know what it is to need because we give them everything. And that's another thing too. When my kids say, Mommy, I want, I want, I say, is it that you want or is it that you need? Because if it's something you need, we can talk about it. But if it's something that you want, that's a different story. Ownership. Again, um, <laughs> I, I am probably everybody's best employee. I didn't realize I was an entrepreneur until 2004 when I began, uh, took my broker shop that I was working with with somebody else and we took it over and became the owners of New American Funding. So it's really only until 2004. So that's why I have a long legacy of these successes because I didn't truly find success until one day I lifted my head up a couple years ago. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have 1,700 employees. I hit success, right? That's pretty successful. So, but I'm a head down type of girl. So I really, my mentality is, is entrepreneurial in a sense. I'm not a big risk taker. I'm learning to take risks in order to really amass wealth. You have to risk some whether it's a little money and, and even just investing in that commercial building. When I first bought my first commercial building, it was very, very scary because it's much different than residential, which I've grown up. I can buy a fourplex in my sleep, right? Fund it in like eight days. But commercial is a whole different animal. I didn't understand the lingo, what's a cap rate, all this different lingo. So it was really interesting. I just bought my first commercial building four years ago. So really these things are just becoming kind of new. So um, I, you know, I started New American Funding as a single mom. So I worked 24-7. I took care of my two kids. They went to boys and girls clubs. When I first started the company in 1997, when I thought I was a really great loan officer, top producer loan officer at Countrywide, I thought it was just me. It wasn't. It was the enterprise. I didn't give credit to the enterprise. So I quit Countrywide to go start my to go more work for another company, but I didn't last very long. And then I decided four months later that I'd kind of go on my own. So um, risk-taking is a big deal. And if you look up the definition of entrepreneur, it does say that. But that wasn't me. I'm foundational. Remember, I'm scared. I don't want to lend my money to my grandma at six because I don't want to lose anything. So I am not the true definition of an entrepreneur. I've become an entrepreneur. And it's great, and it's rewarding, and it's mine, but it's new. It's five years like mine. And so that's why when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you differently, and that probably we're aligning here. You know, you're feeling what I felt five years ago. And, and sometimes I would sit at my desk as my company was growing five years ago and seeing successes and, and watching the numbers go up, thinking, 
is it me? Am, am I smart? I don't know. I don't really know. I, I am now. I'm 50 and I'm smart. <laughs> So I, I hope that when, you're, when I'm talking to you that you feel a little of me and you and that we're not really born sometimes really secure or maybe in two years when you watch me speak I'm going to be like Nelly, right? Because we kind of have that same voice. But again, um, we do, is it a Latina thing, not a Cubana, Mexicana. So entrepreneur, owning your business, yes, five years in, liberating, fantastic, whole new set of skills. Foundation is a little tested, so it's hard on me, but it's taking me out of my comfort zone and it's, it feels pretty good. So I just want to repeat, this is the therapist in me, repeat what I'm hearing from you ladies because... <laughs> free therapy! Free therapy! Because I think what you're saying is we're not just born knowing how to do all this, we have to cultivate it, right? Cultivar a mindset, right? Cultivate a mindset. And it's scary. Yeah. And just because it's scary doesn't mean it's the end of the world, right? So it's like when I called you about the UN thing. and So our first kind of go-to is a scared place. But I also want to say that I think ownership doesn't mean you have to leave your job tomorrow and go be an entrepreneur. Because entrepreneurship is also not for everyone. But Having something in your life that you own and engaging the entrepreneurial muscle is for everyone. And I love what you said about how you talk to your kids. Um, so I thought maybe we give everybody advice. Like there's some things that we each know, whether it's business or about your industry, about the mortgage business, about things that we know. Like what I, what I wanted to tell you is, because um, you talked about stock and I wanted to follow up on that, Warren Buffett, how I've taught myself and my son about stocks, Warren Buffett has a cartoon on AOL.com where he teaches kids how to buy stock. It's like a video game with him as a cartoon. And it's brilliant. And it's meant for kids. And that's how I taught myself and then taught my kid about buying stock. So I mean, you don't have to be like a, everything doesn't have to be brain surgery. Um, there are lots of resources out there and I think what we're missing the most is not understanding el sistema americano, the banking system, the government system, the resources that are out there in nonprofits, the resources that are out there in government, I mean in corporations. There are all kinds of government contracts and contracts in corporations in America for all of us to make money. And so for me, my goal, as much as I want to inspire all of you, is to get you the information so that it opens your mind to possibilities. Like, I'm about to buy my first commercial building with an SBA loan. All these years, I didn't know myself. So it's about it helping each other find information. So I want information from all of you. I think for me, it's the biggest advice is just finding your strengths and weaknesses. I think no one's perfect, and understanding that you're not perfect. I'm a little bit of a control freak. I like to control. <laughs> and, um, and I know that. And I kind of like, okay, back off. Okay, everything's under control. The people got it. And just, you know, I'm also not good with paperwork. And, you know, sometimes technical stuff. So I find people that can help me. Look for people that can, you know, guide you. And Where do you look? Where do you look? I, I mean, yeah. I mean, NARC has definitely been a great source of, resources. So yeah, definitely look for people, look for people that can do the things that you're not good at and that will be, that will help you grow. So I think a couple things. One is I think you have to have a plan as a business owner. Take the time to do a business plan. I see so many businesses that you have an idea, you have a talent, you, you take off running and you don't think about having that plan and any road takes you nowhere. So if you put the time into developing a plan, and there's a lot of organizations, nonprofits out there that will help you do it. SCORE will help you do it. SBA will help you do it. There's a lot of, um, you know, Chambers of Commerce will help you do it. So make sure you take the time to make a plan for yourself. The other thing is know your strengths and know where you need support. Don't try to be all things all the time. 
there's ways that you can um, trade services with other people. If you know somebody else is really good at doing something and you're not, trade your services with them if you can't afford to actually buy it. But don't try to do it all yourself, you guys, if that's not your strength, because you need to focus on your strength. That's what's really going to drive your business. And then the other thing is support each other. We're, we're going to launch this year um, by Latino, and it's going to be statewide in California. I'm really excited about it. we got to support our community, you guys, and we got to support each other. We put a lot of money into this economy, and you know what the sad thing is for us? We have the numbers. We don't have the political clout. We don't have the power in California because we don't unite, and we have to unite together. We have to bring each other up. We have to help each other to be successful, and one of the best ways we can do that is to support each other's businesses. But comes, what comes with that, though, is a lot of responsibility, you guys, because we got to deliver and we got to let people trust in us, too, that we will deliver so that we, our, our community is a community of mistrust with each other. We'd rather go and buy from someone else because we don't trust our own people. That's horrible, you guys. we got to switch that around. But you leverage all these resources that are out there for business owners. A lot of your chambers of commerce have business training programs for you. There's women centers out there. There's you know a lot of a lot of resources, but you just got to take the time to utilize the resources. They're there for you. California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. We have a website. We have a lot of resources on there for you for you to look at to help yourself be successful. So I'm kind of lost a little bit in the question. So. And mortgage. What should we be doing okay, so, more money with our mortgages? Okay. So. <laughs> Let's go to your business. I want to know, should I be refinancing? Oh, there's a lot of lenders in here. They don't want to be giving them <laughs> lending to 101. Can so you, you can. I know. She's not struggling. I, I have a hard time kind of. What you just shared at lunch with me. I, I think that's what everybody needs to hear is, is you buckle down. I do. I am a master mortgage loan originator still. So arguably, I run a very large company, and I still close my own personal production every month. And if there's lenders in here, it's not like it used to be, but I, my head was down in January, and they sent out the top producing list, and I made 22 out of 800 LOs. Wow. So I still do that much personal volume. Find your niche if you're a lender. Find your niche and master it. My niche has been for the last 20 years doing loans for Latinos. Yay. And I speak a very good uh, Spanglish. <laughs> I, I used to have to look up how to say, um, you know, paycheck stuff. We didn't talk that way in the house. So you don't have to master Spanish. I'm culturally in tune with my culture. And um, I grew up in a family where you're not supposed to speak Spanish. My mother was discriminated in you know, East LA. So my Spanish is very good if I want to get food for my grandma and my mother, clean your house, do your schoolwork, perfect, right? My dialect is very perfect. But if a mortgage professional, master your product. So four years ago, I found this wonderful organization, NARA. I was searching, yeah, it's a great organization. Everybody knows I bleed NARA. I now co-chair CBOG for Gary, so in four years, I, I'm passionate about the organization, I'm passionate about Latinos, I'm passionate about home ownership for our communities and the Latino home buyer. In 1994, all of a sudden I decided, I was very young, I thought the refi booms last forever, right? I was going to be killing it forever. All of a sudden, what happens? Rates go up, done. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my gosh, my paycheck went from here to nada. So I thought, you know? Look who's buying. 1994, Santa Ana, California, Latinos. I speak pretty good Spanish, so I'm going to go out and start selling mortgage loans to Hispanic realtors. And I killed it. And you know why I killed it? Because they knew I was there to do business. I was an expert in FHA. It was the barrier to entry was the FHA loan. So then I was a master at it. I could, I could read the 4155 in my, you know, I could, I, I could tell you it in my sleep. So I started that and arguably grew Countrywide's largest Latino arm, and they became the largest non-bank mortgage bank lender to Latino market in the 90s because something I started from passion and the need for money, right? But it was my niche. You're a loan officer, have a niche. So four years ago, again, I'm 34 years in this business, so 30 years, I needed a passion. I needed a reason to get up in the morning and go to work. And for me, it was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing loans for Hispanics. So I found NARA. I aligned myself with the organization, and there it went. 
Today, I am 40% Latino employed. 58% women at NAF over men. Wow. In the mortgage industry. But I set my sights to lift women in this business because it's been so great for me. I have never missed a soccer game, baseball game, nothing. And I run a full-time business and a full-time desk. So for me, I've been my gift to, to lending has been to give back and to let everybody know. But I am a true master. My head is down all the time. I don't deviate. I'm extremely organized like Nelly. If I can't do it, I'm going to get someone to do it. And I am very good. Strength Finders is a book that we run NAF off of. And it is completely 100% true from what every one of us says. I am not a master of all. Of loans, yes, but not of everything. So everything I'm not good at, I hire to compliment me in my business. Wow, you did, you see, you know it. Look at that answer. Incredible. I'm giving all my mortgages to you, Mark. That's it.